Welcome to the Fueled by Joy podcast. I'm your host, Josh Michaelis, and I invite you to join us for an in-depth look at the working dog, from coonhounds to retrievers, pointing dogs to stock dogs, and everything in between. So come with us as we give you an inside look into canine nutrition, as well as the owners, handlers, and animals that make these sports so special. So tune in and enjoy, and as always, get fueled by joy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be episode one of the Fueled by Joy podcast with uh, Frank and Rob Giddings. This is part one of two, and I just want to thank uh, Frank and Rob for sitting down with us because it was a fantastic interview and it was a fantastic time and I think you're really going to enjoy. And so uh, without further ado, uh, here's Frank and Rob. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Josh Michaelis and this is the inaugural Fueled by Joy podcast. Uh, this is a uh, a standalone podcast just for Joy Dog Food, and who better to have on it than the legends of the North, I'm going to call you, uh, Mr. Frank and Mr. Rob Giddings. How are you guys doing? Doing just great. Real good, Josh. How about you? Well, I'm doing great. I tell you what, like I was talking before, before uh, we started recording, is man, it's a, it's a beautiful day out here in North Missouri, and you guys said you had some good weather too, so I think everybody's in a better mood whenever the snow starts melting. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's get right into it. I want to, now you guys, you're known for the Sackett Junior dogs. You're known for all kinds of things, but there's going to be some other things that a lot of people don't know about you guys. But Frank, I want to hear from you first. Uh, how did you guys get started, you know, early on in the, in this coon hunting, in this sport? I started, first time I went coon hunting was with my ex brother in law and brother that was a year younger than me, Ken, and uh, all I wanted to do was play ball. I was about 12, 13 years old. Yeah. He talked me into going one night, and, and uh, they hadn't treated a coon all summer with a bunch of great dogs, and that particular night they did treat a coon. And brother Ken, uh, he couldn't climb a ladder, but... Uh, I told him, I think I could climb that tree. So I climbed up, shook Coon out, and I was hooked from then on. So, did, uh, uh, did, uh, do you think you'd have been hooked if they wouldn't have treated Coon that night? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Probably not. I probably would have been. Once I, somebody called me in going. Cause, so you, but, uh, you were 12? That long, yeah. That you, was a long time ago. And, yeah. Uh, you were 12, 13 years old. When did you get your first dog, Frank? I was 15. Yeah. What kind of dog was it? A registered blue tick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he died. Actually, the guy that I started hunting with then had blue ticks and mom bred mostly. Yeah. And uh, I got that pup, and I think he was about 12, 13 months old, and he died. And... Uh, I got a, another blue tick from uh, Mississippi, and he he didn't pan out too good. And an old man been gone a while now. Dan Reese was his name. Yeah. Uh, he called me one or see me one afternoon. He said, "Lad, uh, will you go hunting with me? Just me and you?" And I said, "Yeah." When we went out to a place we called the club grounds, but we'd hunted the blue dog and all this and that. And that old pair of great dogs, if I remember, we looked at, we made nine trees and looked at nine cones. And uh, on the way home, he said, did you learn anything? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and I never forgot it either. Right. The- so then uh, eventually, uh, I... I got a Walker dog that was a great dog, and I had single registered him in 1961 at Walker Days at Logansport, Indiana. And then we kind of went from there, and then Old Ring was next, and, and uh, his descendant, and then Sackett Jr., and Cord, and all the rest of them. And, so in, in 1961 is when you said you registered, you single registered that great dog? Yeah. How big of a I single how- registered him about. 
Walker days at Logan's Ford, Indiana, yeah. 1961. How big of a process was it back then to single register a dog? Just had to take him hunting a tree of cone. Really? That's all? That's, that, was, all, that was yeah. the only requirement? Yeah. He had to meet the breed standards yeah. and all so on, but yeah. he, he uh, definitely had to, uh, you go out and turn loose and strike tree of cone, I forget, I had to stay three, ten minutes or something like that. Yeah. So you, you mentioned you mentioned Walker Days in Logansport, nineteen sixty one. What uh when did you start competition hunting these dogs? Uh not till Rock River Ring came along. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh the spot and then I I registered a uh female Rock River Bell that my nephew owned. She was kind of a crossed up dog, but but uh she was all white. Mm-hmm bred her to the spot dog and then hunted the dog off of them called blaze and then hunted the dog off him called jackson we had when the uh, ring was a pop right and uh uh then then we just finished ring out by itself and, and went on from there and yeah what what year was that frank that was in the early 70s i got you so when you went to Logansport to single register that dog, it was just for that reason. You didn't compete in any of the hunts or nothing. You just went down no, there so a judge no, so a judge no, could I see just that went dog. Down there. I had met Howard Winchell, was a lifetime friend. Yeah, we've lost him now, but uh, I went down there with him, and he said you need to get that dog registered, Bob. Bob. So we went down there. Pete DeAndres was a secretary of it at that time. And yeah. He's the one that took us out. I'll be darned. Yeah, and uh, Howard had the old Winchell Jake dog, and he was hunting him. He was a half brother of Banjo too, and house is cheap, and so yeah. on. So and, uh, basically, uh, through Howard stuff, I got into the competition part of it. What were the what was the style of those dogs in the in the early '60s to the early '70s before you started hunting Ring? I mean, were they similar to Ring? Were they well? Uh, Back then, way up through old ring and all them, uh, you just you demanded dead dead accuracy mostly. Right. You know, everybody everybody coon hunted because the heights helped out with the families and so on. And uh, uh, so there's more, I think, a lot more so work work type dogs that yeah. took what they could, the moonlight nights or whatever, and just come up with coons. And, yeah. What uh, uh, you guys got? Michigan is notorious for their their coon population. You, they have a reputation, much like where I live, uh, that there that there's a good coon population, and you can treat a lot of coons in a night. Is it pretty much like that where you're at right now, Frank? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, we've got plenty of coons, but we live a mile north of a Muskegon State game area, and Muskegon River runs to it. And it's it's rough. Yeah. It's, it's 12 miles between the road, and, and uh, when you turn one loose, uh, a lot of times it takes you longer to get the dog did for the dog to treat the coat. You know? But uh, uh, now down Middle State, down from, well, we'll say Grand Rapids South, it's all basically farm belt. Yeah. Right. Uh, about an hour and a half east of us and an hour and a half south and you could treat as many coons you want to tree and treat them pretty easy what uh between 60 and 70 between you know you you registering this gray dog and before ring coming along and stuff like that was you were you going through a lot of dogs did you just keep one or two were you hunting super hard or or was it just two. something you were doing as a casual no i hunted seven nights a week i had two dogs yeah and uh, when the old ring come along, I still had two dogs. Right. And then I think the little Jackson dog was me and the two older boys was hunting and uh, got into the fourth or fifth tree we made back in the bottom that night, and he was just laying under the tree. Really? We had to carry him out and got him to the vet and his kidneys and stuff, and the vet said he won't live three days, so. Ring was about 11 months old at the time, so from then on, uh, it was just me and Ring, and then I did, I bought a female Polly that was a younger sister to him that 
My oldest boy hunted all the time, granted out and so on. Uh, back in them times, it was all three hour cast. Right. And, uh, but, uh, but we kind of branched out, never have really kept a whole bunch of dogs. Do you, do you still kind of, kind of follow that policy today? I mean, just, just one, maybe two dogs. Yeah, I got four right now. Yeah. And I've got a two year old dog here and then, then got son and, and, uh, uh, actually I guess I got, uh, well, no, I do own four and then Rob's got one, Jim's got one and Chuck's got one. Yeah. So, you guys got plenty right now. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me we're, we're up in the lower set or, uh, early seventies and you're starting a competition hunt and you've got ring. Tell me about ring. What was he out of? What was he like? You know, anything you can think about him. Ring was, uh, off of merchants ball and Barney mm -hmm. and Dave's queen, which was, uh, off of Howard Winch's old Jake dog, which earlier I said was a half brother to banjo too. And, House of Chief and all them, and his mother was a dance bred female. Right. The old Rock River Ring was raw high top, period. Uh, I'd never seen him. That's all I hunted. And uh, uh, a lot of times, the first coon to he sounded like a frog out there. Really? But uh, yeah, he just, then he'd get back going until daylight, he was fine again. Yeah. But uh, I can't. I can't recall uh, slick trees. I just yeah. When he when he got treed, you just looked at comb. Right. And he's a hard going, hard wide hunting dog. Uh, top outstanding water dog and so on. He was, he's uh, probably come right down to it. I I I've not really for night after night performance. I. The sun dog probably comes as close to him as anything I've had. I, uh, when I knew I was going to, I had talked to, to you and, and Rob and stuff, and I knew I was going to be able to record this podcast. I'd done a little research and I found an old stud ad on Ring and, uh, good looking dog. You had a picture of him in front of trophies and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. I just, I'd just take a look, look like a, just a beautiful hound. And I noticed that the stud fee was a hundred dollars. Yeah, and that, I just that thought, was back in yeah, days. I've seen, I've got some old full cries and stuff that I had saved, you know, and I like looking at all that old stuff in the history of our sport. And there were a lot of fifty dollars stud fees or a lot of dogs for just yeah. for pup. And here's Ring sitting here at hundred dollars. That that that's like a thousand dollar stud fee or better today. Yeah, did absolutely. You, did you breed a lot yeah. of? Fe I mean, I think you did, if my memory serves. But you bred quite a few females to Ring, right? Yeah, him and uh, him and. Timothy Ball's Hickory Nut, original Hickory Nut Harry, was the two leading stud dogs at that time. Right. And, uh, did you, uh, did you get the promotional, you didn't get the promotional bug that, that, uh, T-Ball did, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Tim I'll tell you, Timothy was, was famous. There, yeah. Uh, there was a whole slew of people come for a week hunt. Timothy Ball, Merchant, and I mean, we had a great time. Yeah. And, uh, my wife, uh, she made biscuits that pile on the table like you wouldn't believe every morning, but the coon club down the road, the ladies always had a midnight supper down there for everybody hunted. Yeah. And, uh, I come in the house here and Timothy was sitting at the table talking to my wife. And he <laughs> said, well, the truth of the matter is, Miss Oakley, Frank promotes his dogs by hunting them, and I promote mine with my penmanship in the in the magazines. He wasn't <laughs> and, he wasn't wrong, was he? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, he was uh, he was a special case. Timothy was yeah. T ball was something yeah. else. He was a he was yeah. a pioneer in that part of it. I think. Oh well, as far as uh, writing ads and all this and that, no, uh, yeah, he was. I wasn't in his class. No, I don't think even anybody today is in his class. <laughs> and actually, I didn't want to be in his <laughs> class. In yeah, that's right, me neither. <laughs> so it's early 70s. Uh, you're hunting ring, uh, and everything's going pretty good. It seems like when did when did Rob come along? When did Rob start hunting? 
Uh, Rob was, uh, if I remember right, I think he was six weeks old when he started. Six weeks. Yeah. That's pretty young. Might as well, might as well find out what you got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, do you do you remember your first cue night? Now I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say it was probably your dad that got you started. Yeah, yeah. I figured I figured that was the case. Do you remember your first cue night and when was it? Um, well, the first one I was old enough to remember was uh, a dog off from Ring Ring Junior. They called him Irish. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, vaguely remember that. That'd been a long, long time ago. What What year did you start following your dad around? Well, I was born in '74, and uh, pretty much just started right in. Yeah, started following his brothers around the boot. Yeah, yeah. my brothers are uh, 15 and 14 years older than I am. So oh, heavens. Yeah. So I had lots of people to follow and tote me along and yeah. carry me and all that good stuff. I, if your my brother's a lot older than me, too, and I'm going to guess that your brothers probably didn't baby you around too much out there, did they? No. <laughs> <laughs> mine did, I was mine that didn't either. just jump in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, if I remember right, I got in some kind of bad situations because i was the one who was still small enough to fit in certain spots right I, yeah them den trees and them holes in the ground and things like that yeah. you can get a little kid in it's hard to get a grown man in heck yeah when kunites were 30 40 bucks a piece you know little brother was kind of expendable <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> So hunting, hunting with these hounds has been a family affair for all of you for as long as you can remember. Frank, how did 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 your dad hunt? No. Oh, so you just my went dad, in. You just my, went in with your dad, buddies then. Yeah, when I was just a little tyke, my dad run off and left nine of us. No kidding. Yeah, and I, so I just soon all bet that part of my life. Well, I don't blame but, you uh, there either. I swore mine had never to see that, and they haven't. So. We, we, we've got a we've got a great family thing and i'm tickled to death with it so is my wife that's awesome that's awesome yeah. when did uh so we, we were hunting ring uh rob's bouncing around on the cradle with his brothers packing him around uh what did you hunt what dog come in after ring uh ring junior dog ring two dog uh basically uh ring stuff yeah. Uh, dog I bought from Don Hall in Indiana. We call him Rink. He was a went back to old Rink five, six times. He was an outstanding dog. And, uh, uh, and then uh, I think the first year I'd met Howard, he was going down to James Merchant's hunting and invited me to go along. And, you know, when we was younger, I thought, Banjo, too, my God, that dog walks on water. Yeah. You know? And, uh, so I, I went with him down there and met James, and we was friends till the day he passed away. But uh, uh, I found out that even them paper dogs didn't walk on water. That's right. Tell, well, me, tell me about hunting with James. What was it like? Was, it, was he an entertainer, like I assumed he yeah. was? <laughs> uh, if you want, I won't mention some names or told them, but if you went to their house, to spend a dollar, they they give you a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, if you pull up the James Merchants, if you sat there five minutes, you just like you known him his whole life. Yeah. There was never no no pressure about doing no bid no nothing like that. No. He he was a good friend and he helped me a lot when I was just young and naive about a lot of stuff and all that. And, uh, I thought a lot of him. Yeah. Back in the one we went, he called one time in the summer, and I mean, it, you know, you're in the south, so you know how hot it gets down there in July mm. and August. You bet. And uh, he always thought quite a bit of my wife, and he called and said, "Bring the opie and come down." And she said, "I don't think I want to go for him being so hot." He said, well, I'll, "You tell her what I'm gonna leave right now, and I'm going down." I'm going to town and buy her an air conditioner and putting that bedroom up there. <laughs> and sure enough, when we got there, she had a new air conditioner in. Oh, well, that's awesome. And we'd hunt 
down there late or laid up here. When I get up here, he'd have her at the kitchen table in here <laughs> telling her all about the old dog and all that. She ain't got a clue what he's talking about, but, <laughs> uh, but she, uh, she thought a lot of him. And then he called me and, uh, so son, I'm going to be gone a couple of weeks. And I, I just thought he'd going somewhere hunting. He said, he's going, uh, oh, well, to Manila. Well, I thought, what? <laughs> I'd never heard of it. And I thought, where's that? And he said, it's across the water. <laughs> what? I said, what, what in the world are you going over there for? He said, I'm going over there to try that woman out. <laughs> And I'm sitting at the table, and she's my wife's looking at me like, "What the world's going on?" And I thought, "You got, you got it." Uh, anyway, when we got hung up, I told her, and uh, so he went over there. And I don't know how long it was. He was gone a couple of weeks, and then he got her shipped over here. <laughs> he, had to shop, he had to shop around well, for a while. Yeah, and then <laughs> I think uh, once she got here. She had 90 days, and then she's either got to go to Chicago and get her papers, or else she has to go back. Yeah. So he called up in one day, and he said, be all right, come up the weekend. He said, I want Oki to meet Ronnie. I said, yeah, it's great. He said, well, we got to stop at immigration uh, Chicago, and he said, I'll, uh, we'll be up. And I always work second shift. And mm -hmm. I got home that night, and... She was out by his truck there. So didn't hardly talk much. I said, you must be Ronnie. That's right. She just, yip, yip, yip. <laughs> oh, come in the house, and I took a quick thing. You got a sandwich. Get ready to go hunting. I have to look. She's over there putting merchant socks on. <laughs> putting his boots on him, and my wife's over there shaking her head. Don't even think about it. <laughs> so she... She had a little talk about, well, Ronnie, about American women. And <laughs> Rob was about, what was you, 13, maybe 14 down there. We yeah. went down there, and Harvey French used to hunt, maybe quite a bit. Yeah. And he had a boy Rob's age, and Jim's got a fish pond on his place. The boys was out there fishing, and uh, they caught seven, eight fish, and Burton said, Ronnie, uh, Get them fish skin. So we're sitting around there yik yakking, and he had to look over there after about half an hour. And uh, I seen Oki go over there talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> Marches, Marches, uh, he, he, he just wanted him alone. He said, Ronnie, by God, I told you to skin, skin them fish. He said, by God, American women don't skin no fish. <laughs> I thought Mercury was going to blow up. He finally got up and gave Opie a hug and said, Damned if you ain't ruined her. <laughs> yeah, I swear. Now, those are the kind of stories, Frank, that I do this for right here because nobody yeah. on this planet that wasn't there wouldn't have known something like that. That is fantastic. No. And the characters that are in this sport. You know, like James, and like I can name a hundred others. Some of them I've yeah. had I've had on some podcasts before with Houndsman XP and stuff, and it's just such a unique sport with unique individuals. But I think we've talked about Timothy Ball, and I think James was was one of the more unique ones. <laughs> yeah, well, he he, uh, you know, he, Tim and Marilyn was married. She was a well, Marilyn was a real nice lady. I mean, yeah. They divorced, but it definitely was not Marilyn's fault. Right. I mean, uh, Jim, uh, we go down there and up here, uh, if you go hunting, you don't, wife don't expect to see you to breakfast. Yeah, we go down there and tree a cone or two, go to the house and eat pour that Coke and a little bit of Coke to color it in that water glass full of, uh, Whiskey will sit yep. there and talk to you and that and me and Howard to go back up. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, all in all, he was, a, he was a great person. And uh, uh, one thing about it, if he was his friend, 
he was a friend and uh, he was he was truthful, you know. Yeah. Uh, his lifestyle when he's younger sure didn't abide by mine and all that right. much because but uh uh he finally got over that and I heard him and Opie talking here at the table one day and he told told her, said I since me and Ronnie's been together I've never never looked at another woman and uh, I thought, Well, you finally growed up. Well, you're sixty years old, but it took a while. <laughs> it's, about, <laughs> it's about time, huh? <laughs> you finally made the grade. <laughs> You mentioned you touched on going out with James and Trina Coon or two and coming back to the house earlier than you going back out. And Frank, you've been, um, I, the first time I, I had heard of you and I had been around you, you brought some dogs down to Jess Dickerson's and Russ Myers for the stud dog hunt. Yeah. And I don't know, I, I don't that. know, I don't know if you remember meeting me, but I talked to you a few times there and I remember meeting you, but, uh, you were notoriously. Let me, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. The first night there, and the, the big storm hit. Was you out there under the patio? Or was you out there hunting? I was under the patio where all the smart people were. <laughs> <laughs> that that that's where the people that knew better were sitting. Was under the patio. <laughs> but I'll tell you, that was a that was that something. was a great weekend. Yeah. I think everybody had a great time out there, and I mean, no hostilities a month or nothing. And I thought it went just great. I and did too. I really them, did. Ross and Jeff was great hosts, too. Yes, definitely. But one one thing I wanted to touch on is back then, everyone just, you were a notoriously hard hunter. Uh, the nights and the hours and the time that you put into these dogs, you were famous for back then, and I assume before that, and probably even after that. Uh, what, because, you know, I like to say I hunt hard, but I've been around hunt harder, or hard hunters, and I know I don't. You know, I'm getting three, four nights a week on the weeks that I'm hunting hard, two, three hours a night for a couple nights, and then all night another. But everybody I've talked to that hunts with you and that's hunted around you has said that, that Frank Giddings goes hunting and he hunts hard. And, you know, how do you keep that drive for so long? I mean, it's you've been doing this a long time, Frank, and it's, by all accounts, you're still going at it pretty good rate. Well, I think a lot of it goes... I mean, I love I love the hunting part, but uh, and since we got into the breed stuff in here, we've always, as the generations went on, we've always been able to come up with another pretty well top dog. And, yeah. Uh, myself, I demand a lot out of a dog because I don't take no mercy on myself. I don't care where they get treated. I'm gonna go get them. Yeah. And fortunately i got three boys that's got the same philosophy uh if they turn one loose uh they're going they're going to go get them you know? and uh it's not a a forceful thing in any that just i've done it all my life and i guess probably uh will keep on doing it. been blessed with a woman that puts up with me yeah that and, that's that's harder to find than a good coon dog yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, peace, and good you know? and good yeah. coon dogs are hard to find. <laughs> yeah. So, I want to talk about. Uh, of course, I want to talk about Sackett Junior. I do, and that is probably um, when you talk about stud dogs and you talk about all time greats and you talk about uh, you know what, the impact that dogs have had on a breed. You're you're it's Sackett Junior. It's Lipper. Uh, it's Naylor and it's very few others. I mean, Sackett Jr. is right up there with the all-time greats. And what yeah. what made him such a dominant reproducer? What were some of the the things that he passed on to his pups consistently? And and how did you, I, I? To be honest, I want to hear the whole history. Where did you first lay eyes on him? How did he come about? The whole works. Okay, uh, I owned old Sackett. Well. Merchant's Tree Blaster, we called him Catfish. Yep. And uh, Jim wanted the dog. He sold uh, uh, his stud dog. And Merchant's philosophy was if you sold a stud dog, you got something opposite that you could breed that one's daughters back to. Mm -hmm. Where I'm more stable with the same thing, and, and I'm more up on the line breeding part of things to where if you got a program and it's working right, you're you're always supposed to come up with one. I agree. Um, I agree. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, 
a uh, boy used to haunt me a lot. Don't haunt anymore. Kevin Bletch was his name. Uh, me and him, I hunted him some. Kevin hunted him some. He was a, an awful good hound. As far as the coon dog, probably pretty well top dog. That would have been the old, old Rock River Sacket. Yeah. But didn't reproduce on outside females at all. Right. If you bred him into Yak and River stuff, uh, you was all right. But that's basically what he was with a little Tidewater Shep stuff in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I draw this guy, Ernie Skeen was his name. It had this female off the honey's bone. Uh, you couldn't shut her mouth from the least sign, but she was a tree dog. Mm-hmm. And uh, between me and Kevin, I think we beat her four or five times. Anyway, when she come to see, he, Ernie called me and wanted to breed her. And I said, uh, yeah, that's fine. And uh, I said, I'll breed her for a male pup. Okay. Well, I brought her and she had five pups and lost two of them. <clears throat> she raised two females and a male. And uh, well, he called me one day and he said, he left. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be it for Frank and Rob this week, and we're going to continue this conversation next week. And uh, you will get to hear about how how Frank got his hands on one of the greatest uh, stud dogs in the history of the Tree and Walker breed, Mr. Sackett Jr. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, we're going to do more with Frank and Rob next week, so stay tuned. Do you have a hardworking dog? How about a mom about to give birth some pups? Our Super Mule 3020 is perfect for either scenario. With a whopping 510 k cows per cup, your dog will have more energy than ever before. It will also help keep your dog in top shape even while working or nursing pups. The added pumpkin will not only help with a healthier stool, but it also provides added calcium, which will help with lactation. Added magnesium will help with muscle repair, and the added vitamin B will help not only mama, but her pups thrive. And of course, our key ingredients, omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, glucosamine and chondroitin, vitamin E and zinc, will help keep them healthy from the inside out with a shinier coat, healthier joints, and a healthier immune system. Over 75 years with no recalls and 100% American-made, you can rest assured you are feeding your dog the best bang for your buck. Get Super Meal today. Call 800-245-4125 or visit joydogfood.com. Welcome to the Fueled by Joy podcast. I'm your host, Josh Michaelis, and I invite you to join us for an in-depth look at the working dog, from coonhounds to retrievers, pointing dogs to stock dogs, and everything in between. So come with us as we give you an inside look into canine nutrition, as well as the owners, handlers, and animals that make these sports so special. So tune in and enjoy, and as always, get fueled by joy. Fuel your dog with confidence. Fuel them with power. Fuel them with Joy High Performance 2618, made with the highest quality of ingredients, with beef being the first. Our key ingredients, omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, glucosamine and chondroitin, Vitamin E and zinc will have your dog's coat looking healthier than ever, healthier joints, and a stronger immune system. Not only will your dog have more confidence in the field with our high performance, but you can rest assured that you are feeding your dog a top quality food, knowing that all of our products are 100% American made and our brand has gone over 75 years without any recalls. Fuel your dog with confidence. Fuel them with Joy High Performance 2618. Call 800-245-4125 or visit our website, joydogfood.com, to find a dealer near you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode two with Frank and uh, Rob Giddings. Uh, We've got some great feedback on the first episode. We really appreciate everybody listening. Uh, Remember to uh, Give us that five-star rating on iTunes and Spotify whenever you listen to us. Make sure and subscribe. That's how uh, people can find the podcast, and that's how the algorithm works. I know. It's weird. 
But uh, I was going to do a great big long intro and, and do a bunch of other stuff, but everybody's clamoring for this. So without much further ado, let's pick it up with Frank uh, talking about uh, how Sackett Jr. came about. And so uh, we're just going to get right into it. Was operator for a male pup. Okay. Well, her brother, she had five pups and lost two of them. <clears throat> she raised two females and a male. And uh, well, he called me one day and he said, he lived about a couple hours north of me. And he said, you want to meet over there and I'll bring you your pup. And I said, yeah, that's fine. So I went up and he had a female pup there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I was supposed to get the male. And no, no, he said, you get the female. I'm keeping the male. So that, that was the last time that I made a pup deal. Yep. And uh, following year down to Walker section of Bellevue, Michigan, we, we got there and there was a crowd of people around over there. And I, you know, wonder what's going on. And I walked over there and uh, Ernie was standing in the middle of all them people and uh, had this young dog there on a the lease. And, a friend of mine, Roger Williamston, was standing there and he was trying to buy the dog. And uh, I said, what's going on, Rod? And he said, well, I've, I've tried to buy this young dog. I offered him $2,000 for him right there off the lease, but he won't sell him. I looked and I seen Ernie and I said, uh, is that that pup off a sacket? <clears throat> and he said, yep. Yeah. So... I don't know how long it was after that. He called me up, Ernie did, and said, uh, you'd be interested in buying this young dog? I think his boy got some problems or something. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you want for him? He said, $3,000. And I said, whoa. Oh, I said, well, I'm not going to buy him without looking at him. And he said, I'll, uh, I'll meet you down there. And he said, you, we got a hunt up here in a couple of weeks and, you just take him down and hunt him to the, he said, was you coming up to the hunt? And I said, yeah. Well, I brought him home and hunted him, went up to the hunt that night up there. And you got to understand, this is the northern Michigan. These, are, these old boys are rough now. Yeah. <laughs> they work in the woods, and we drive back this old lane back through there, and there's an old uh, log shack that they'd made where the hunt was. Yeah. So we walked in, and, and uh, I called Ernie and told him I was going to take the dog. I said, "Make sure, I just make sure his paper works all up to date." So I went in, and they had an old plate table there. We sat there, and I I started painting for the dog. And this one guy said, uh, "Man, you got to be ignorant." <laughs> and I said, "What?" He said, you got to be eating. And he said, I got a good dog out there. I'll sell you for $300. Hmm. Oh, I got Ernie paid anyway, and we draw yeah. it out. So I draw it out with that guy. And we went out there, and I skinned him pretty good. And uh, we come back in. Of course, this, this guy was, he was a nice guy, but kind of a blowy type guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, we come back in, and here are all the people watching, you know. I forget his first name, but he said, they said, what happened? How bad did you beat him? The guy looked around and he said, you know what? Somebody said, what? He said, that guy's a lot smarter than I thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> People don't understand now $3,000 yeah. back then was a lot oh, for a yeah. dog. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Sackett Jr. Uh, was easy to train, and my son sitting right here beside me. Yes. Had a boy he went to school with. They hunted him quite a bit. Now, when he was young, he gets the blanks. Yeah. And Sunshine sitting over here ain't used to that. <laughs> He's not to look at them first, you know. So, I got up around here the Monday in the afternoon or something, I said, I'll hunt going. He said, Dad, uh, I, I don't want to hunt that dog anymore. And I said, what? 
No, he said, he's got slick trees. And I told him, well, you just hunt whatever you want to hunt. Leave him to daddy. <laughs> went, down to, went down to Merchants, and I took him with me down there. Yeah. And uh, he would get some slicks now, but when he got one, you had to go get him. You know? Yeah. And, what, uh, uh, hey, Rob, what dog did you want to hunt instead of Sackett Jr. is what I want to know. I, I swapped him back for Sackett. Oh yeah, so your old Sackett was still still up and running pretty good then. Yeah, he, yeah. he was uh, he was that accurate, outstanding mouth. He was a he was a real good hound. Yeah, I was I was like uh, 16, 17 and really liked to shoot stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. We 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 wasn't into training young dogs when we were sixteen or seventeen. <laughs> we, no. we wanted to just treat raccoons because, yeah. especially during coon season, I know when I was sixteen or seventeen, that's what paid a lot of my stuff. Yeah, exactly. It, it paid my beer bill most that, of the time. I yeah. don't know if that, that was you or not, but that, that's what it paid for well, me anyway. Back back when uh. A couple of years there when our coons was forty dollars out of the freezer, we had yeah. a good buyer. Then his oldest brother was the worst one of the bunch. <laughs> 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 when you cut him loose in the section, and we'd always have it. Chuck was usually the truck man. Yeah, and we run about a hundred mile radius of home, but the rest of us would be dropped off in a section around, and he'd pick us up, and he had a dog off the. Ray Junior dog that was a wide hunting dog. So when he got treated each day and when he go get him and and pick up, drop off and so on. But yep. uh, back to Sackett Junior, uh when I went down to Merchants there, uh well, the next spring we was went down and he called me, I said, Yeah, we'll be down. We went down there and, and uh me and him had, had a few talks and stuff and you could put them trees in your pocket to yeah. And uh, we went down there and, and uh that was uh in the spring and the next year we went out to Texas. Me and Jim and Howard Winchell went out and hunted with Billy Lynn Ball and, and David Fletcher and and uh uh Kenny Richards lived down in the had a dog called Warrior and him and Junior about stole the show out there. And, uh, yeah. We got back to Jim's and Jess Dickinson called and uh, wanted to come up and breed Naylor's sister to him. Right. So uh, Jim had been uh, breeding Sackett down there, the old dog, and he he uh, started missing. So he had, I forget how many repeats. And uh, so I just told him, I said, well, just if people want to breed the the junior, they can. That's fine. Yeah. And just boom, boom, uh, them repeats is probably what put him on the road. Because yeah. uh, it just, on that day on, when them pups started hitting the ground, you could you could breed into anything and get tree dogs. You know? Yeah. What were you seeing? Uh, was it was it just that easy starting, uh, looking to get tree type dogs that he was throwing, you know, that were... I mean, because let's be honest, the, the dogs that have that tree in them genetically are easier to start. Uh, they, yeah, they are, they are what easy. It was. You, yeah. just, you just have to expose them. Right, right. And uh, uh, it didn't matter what you bred. Uh, and, you know, I mean, he slept as smart as much on the Walker breed as any dog I ever had, and he'd done it in only three and a half years. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if he wouldn't have got killed or uh, two weeks before <clears throat> or after his death was when we were supposed to start collecting him. Yeah. So, I mean, if if a man had the sperm thing, the straws there today, uh, he wouldn't have to worry about a grocery bill. No, no, heavens no. I mean, you just look but, at what some of his pups that have been collected uh, yeah. some what their straws are going for is insane. Yeah. But tell me about, and this may not be something you want to talk about, but, uh, tell me about how he got killed and, and the dangers. I mean, anytime you turn a dog loose, anytime you have a dog, even in a kennel or any, I mean, they're, they're always at risk. Yeah. You know, so. Well, uh, the two guys that we've talked about, Ball and Merchant, Merchant's my type of person. Yeah. Uh, James Merchant, if you went there to see his stud dog go, 
he would absolutely turn him loose. I don't care what. You, you might bet. have to go get him. But now Jim would turn him loose. Yep. Timothy wouldn't. And I don't know how many sermons I've heard from Timothy about quit hunting my dog, you know. And yep. basically, uh, it was for Timothy's benefit. I quit because he, people, people always said, hey, one thing about him up there, he'll turn that dog loose. And, yep. and you know, Timothy was was again there. So uh, Don Hall and Indiana down there, a good friend of mine, they had Tom Lechner and, and uh, there were some friends of theirs from Kentucky. And we bought, bought a dog called Style that we was hoping would be the outcross, but it, it didn't work out. But yeah. anyway, this guy wanted to breed a female, a, one female a junior, and one female a Style. And he said, I'll meet you there at Don's. He was from Kentucky. He said, we'll meet you there at Don's at dark. Well, we got down there probably. 30, 40 minutes before dark and had coffee with Don and him and Don's wife, which is a, she's a, she's a great lady too. And, uh, the guys never showed up. Well, mm -hmm. we went hunting and we treat three or four cones, if I remember right, and it started snowing. In fact, we had snow up here and that's one reason they wanted to meet down there. Yeah. And we got back there about Midnight, loaded the truck, was, was heading home and seen lights coming down the lane. Uh, down the back in a little. And it was these guys from Kentucky just getting there. Yeah. So we bred both females. And the one guy said, uh, man, I'd give anything right off with that dog. I told him, just get your boots on. I said, we'll go turn loose for one comb, and then I said, we're heading north. So yeah. We went to turn him, him and tell Sacker, who's Rob's dog, and uh, turn him in a section, and the only car we heard or anything was that one. We was out in Amish country. Rob and him drove around there. He laid that car. That's how he got killed right there. Yeah. And, you know, if the guys had been on time, uh, we have been on our way home, but that's, I'm a firm believer, uh, it's meant to happen. It's going to happen. How old was, how old was Sackett Jr. when he died? Seven. He was seven years old. So he had a good, yeah. at, at least two more years in the stud pen. Yeah. At least. Yeah. And, then, and Sackett yeah. Jr. Uh, was a, I've never seen a dog you could, Somebody come, we'll say you pulled in to breed your female, and it was just the old dog would stand there, and you think he don't care nothing about a female. Yeah. Dip around, he'd hop up there and kind of look up me, and you could guide him, breed a female, and a minute's time they was they was hung, and that was it. Yeah. And uh, the only other time I had him give me a dirty look was. I might not say that because this guy's a good friend too. But uh, he come here to breed a female. I mean, she's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this thing was ugly. I looked at him and I said, sure, that ain't what he got to bring. <laughs> but it was. A while to the tunnel we went. And uh, boy, she flagged heavy and he looked up at me and said, hey, <laughs> come on, boss. <laughs> No. <laughs> Give me a break just yeah. once. <laughs> hey, did you hunt him? That, did that, you hunt him after you bred them that, females? That fellow's name was Lee Logan, and Lee's yeah. a great guy. But uh, that old female left. She desired something for looks. Did the pups but turn out? How, I, how I don't doubt she wasn't a real good female. Yeah, I say, how'd the pups turn out of that cross? Do you remember? I don't think there was... Uh, Anything strong Noriata, but he lived up there in Pennsylvania in mountains and a lot of a lot of his stuff went to where it didn't get right. publicized too much either. Right. That's the one thing I want to ask you is you had a lot of success and not just with Sackett Junior. You guys have had stud dogs before, after, since. You know, you've been in the stud dog business a bunch. You know, you and Rob both have have had really good dogs that have thrown really good pups and you know, you're consistently, you guys consistently have one. 
I mean, since 70 to right now, I assume you guys got something up there that's probably throwing pretty good pups. What do you, uh, both of you, what do you attribute that success to, you know, mostly? You got to have what you start. And if you, if you like what you got, when you start, you got to stay with it. Yeah. But family wise, you know, I don't, I don't like inbreeding, but, uh, the family stuff I do, I mean, cousins, uncles, aunts, grandparents here, there, mother, ever like that. And, uh, so far, uh, we've been successful at it and, uh, probably like anybody else. It's hard. I haven't really found it yet. Uh, a uh, consistent outcross. Yeah. Basically, the best luck I have is staying. But I like a hard going dog, and and some people will tell you, oh, he's got good dogs, but they trail too much. Well, yeah. if they can't trail on this river bottom down here, you ain't going to treat many cones. Yeah. And I've had a lot of people come and, and this and that, and they'll say that the dog won't leave the road when they hit that water. Yeah. Oh. So, but uh, that's the type of dog takes suit me, and uh, uh, if you're going to try to suit everybody in the world, you're not going to be successful. You gotta, you kind of get with something, and if it's working, you stick with it. Rob, what do you think about all that? I, pretty much just what he just said. Uh, I've pretty much always just tried to go along the lines of what do I like. Yep. And not subtle, and, and it's worked out pretty good. Um, like Dad said, the stuff I like, some people hate, but other people's like other people likes it too. Yeah, I, and I, I've always said you got to please yourself first. Yeah, and like Dad said, uh, coon hunt this river bottoms. That's a primarily the only place I hunt anymore. And like he said, a dog's got to be able to trail, and it's got to be tough and wide going to to work down there. And, uh, you know, what, what that does is by having something there, it, it helps other people in the breed who maybe are looking for a little more trail than what they've got, you know, yeah. take, take something that's a little bit heavy on the tree and you can come back to some of the old trailing type dogs. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to touch on and some of the traits that you know, because we've been in this for a while, too, you know, since, uh, you know, I've been hunting since 85, uh, been competition hunting since 2000, so, you know, i got 20 years in that, but I want to talk about what I've noticed about Sackett Jr. stuff and what your guys' stuff has passed on down the line, and I, it's focus. Uh, I know we put dogs under a lot of pressure, especially hauling them up and down the road in these money hunts every week. And it seems like, especially back in the early 2000s when Sackett Jr. was hot and all these dogs were coming out and they were, they were just focused on tree and coons. They didn't care kind of what was going on around them. The pressure didn't bother them as much. They were just, they liked tree and coons and that's what they done. And if they got beat, it was because something was just better at tree and coons than them. It wasn't because of some outside reason. Is that something that you guys noticed in this line of dogs? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, um, they're great buddies around you during the day, but when you take the leash off from them at night, they, they're pretty one track minded, you know? Yeah. Frank, did you, uh, notice that with Sackett Jr. like that? I mean, cause you're talking about, you, you mentioned that he, he was kind of weird around females. He would breed them and he would, everything was great and stuff, but the dog probably wanted to just go hunting. And yeah, so, he, uh, uh, you could you, you could breed a female and take him and the female right out if you wanted to. Yeah. And, I mean, he he was uh, never had a problem getting any bread and none of that kind of stuff. But, no, uh, <clears throat> he wasn't a – well, he was a merchant. <laughs> 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 and uh, he, he – uh, you know, a female coming in season or whatever, if you, we'll say you call me and said, I'd like to see Junior go, but 
I like to hunt my female, but she, she just started bleeding three or four days ago. I tell her, hell, if you want to hunt her, well, then bring him. You, you can hunt yeah. her, well, you won't hunt her. Yeah. And uh, if they were if they were coming, they were ready to breed. He just bred them with no problem. And and uh, 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 now the dog we got here, uh, the sun dog. Now, I mean, uh, he's crazy over a female. Yeah. Yeah, all the yeah. we had Skipper and Skipper was crazy over a female. Skipper's pups were crazy over a female. Yeah, you know it was just some dogs seem like they're focused on coons. Some were focused on whatever was in front of them that would take their mind off coons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so Sackett, we we've talked about the success that Junior had, and Sackett and and others, but I want to touch on Rat Attack while I got you guys here. Now, Rat, uh, I don't think that maybe with the money hunts like they are today and people still having semen stored on like Zeb 3 and some of these other dogs like that, but as far as on the PKC side, I, what Sackett Jr. has done as far as winning is unreal. Uh, now, Sackett is pretty controversial, or uh, Rat Attack is pretty controversial. He gets he gets some grief, too. Now, I've, I've been a fan of rat dogs if they're trained right and hunted right and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what do you think, you know, that's that's a pup out of Sackett Jr. that was one of the most dominant reproducers as well. Uh, do you guys have any familiarity? I know Buzz had him and, and Kevin and all that stuff, you know, but I, I, the history of rat attack, you guys, I assume know it pretty well. I mean, that's one of the, one of the top reproducers in the world and he's out of your stuff. Yeah. Well, no doubt about it. Them guys, all good guys and, and so on, heavy advertisers and, uh, pushers and a lot of different handlers put on, you know, on dogs and yeah. off a rat and, uh, no, in fact. He stole a lot of good dogs, stole a lot of too much street dogs. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but I, I hunted with dogs off a route that was dead accurate. Yeah. But I've also hunted the other part too. Right. And, uh, uh, Tim the ball, as far as I'm concerned, when he bred rat sisters to Harry, the, the, the new Harry dog there, that's when he started putting some winners on the ground. Yep. Yep. I agree. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but, uh, yeah, right at that, uh, suppressed Junior, but he was bred, I guess, till he went sterile, and, uh, the old dog, he done in three and a half years, would have took him 10 to 12, 15 years to do. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've got nothing to respect for the dog, because, uh, he helped to walk a breed. I don't think he, to my personal opinion, I don't think he helped it as much as his daddy did. Right. But uh, that's just my own opinion. You know? Well, I mean, it was just in June of last year that I drew a rat attack dog. You know, I drew, I drew Kurt, who was hunting Whitey, who's direct off rat attack. And so those dogs are still out there putting numbers up where yeah. Sack yeah, Jr. Did, uh, he didn't yeah. have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, them guys... Uh, all kind of semen collected and all that. So, yeah, uh, the dog actually will be around for for quite a while yet, for a long time. Right, right. right. And even but, just uh, grand pups, you know, and, uh, there's going to be a lot of rat grand pups around yeah, it, for the yeah, next absolutely. for the next ten years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the uh, I've never had a dog collected except some. And, right. Uh, Randy Smith got some semen off him, and he wanted a boy out, uh, Tim Chase out west, and Brandon mm -hmm. just took him in. But, uh, you know, boy hunts with us a lot. He's, he handles son on a lot of the hunts, Doug McCombs. And, yep. uh, uh, he, he's uh, Doug's a good handler, and, and uh, actually, Brandon wanted DJ to hunt the dog when he's like a year old or something like that. And he brought him up. DJ called me and didn't think much of him. And Brandon wanted me to take half, or just half interest in him. And I kind of turned that down and he called me again. So I said, well, I'll bring him up there and hunt him a bit. Yeah. I, I brought him up there and put him in the river bottom. And, uh, well, a couple three months went by and 
Brent, uh, Doug called me and he said, I'm going to go down there to hunt with Brandon. You want to go? And I said, yeah, I'll go with you. So after about the third or fourth coon there, Doug told me, uh, how about me handling that dog in the hunt? So I told him, that's fine with me. If it is with Brandon, go ahead. So, yeah. So, so he basically, uh, he, he basically handled the dog a lot. In, hunting. in fact, from that time on, pretty well handled him in all of them. Yeah. And um, we've got a dog together off him now. This five years old is titled out and all. And, uh, he's off of a son and a track man female. We we're talking about, we've talked about the, and you, you just brought this up, what you have now. We've talked about the days of yore and junior and rat and, and ring and all these dogs and old sacket. So what do you guys, uh, Frank and Rob, what do you guys both got in the works at the moment? You got any young dogs? You just got older dogs? What are you guys hunting? Uh, I've got a two year old dog and, uh, the five year old dog I just told about, uh, Rob's got, if you're counting coon tails in rough country, Rob's hunting the best female I know of. Really? What's she, what's she out of? Old dogs. Yeah. Yeah. She goes, she uh, goes all the way back to old towel ringing them. Really? But she, yeah, she's got, uh, a little bit of everything. Yeah. I mean, she mojo on the bottom goes back to, a, uh, old towel, which puts her about as close to old Rock River Ring as anything living now. Yeah. I want to talk I want to talk about Tail Rob because uh Shannon Tabor, which is a name I never dreamed I'd mention on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a gentleman in Arkansas. He had a female, I believe she was out of Tail Sacket. Yes, sir. That uh he was really high on and you hear Tail and Tail never bred as many females as Junior or or some of the other dogs you guys had, but he was he reproduced pretty dominantly too. It just seemed he, like he didn't quite get the exposure. Am I wrong there? Or? No, I he threw really good reproducing females. Yeah. Yeah. Um the males off from him, they they were all right, but the females stood out. Right. And I think Tell was just a product of his time. Yeah. Um, I think because Junior passed away and Tell had never bred a female and he was uh he was over two years old and never bred a female. Then Rat caught on right there. Right. And then on our own personal side, uh just about the time Tell was starting to breed females, Cord showed up. Right. And Cord was a flashy devil. I mean Outstanding reproducer. Yeah. yeah. If, if you looked at the two of them and listened to them tree and all that, it, it was pretty obvious why Tell wasn't breeding a lot of females. But, right. um, yeah, I liked what he threw. They suited me pretty good. Yeah, I see you still see him pop up in some pedigrees, you know, here and there, and it's of dogs that are winning big and dogs that are doing well. And, you know, That's he, right. he would just came, he see, yeah, he, like you said, he just came around, cord was there, rat was there. And, you know, those were the two that were being promoted the heaviest. So that's kind of what got bred to instead of tail. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I love about this female. Uh, actually how I ended up with her, she, she's a granddaughter to hotel. Yeah. I'm sorry, a great granddaughter. And that perked my interest. And the boy brought her down for us to try. And she looked dumb as hell that night, yeah. but everything she looked dumb as hell doing was the same stuff that Tell looked dumb as hell doing when he was, yeah. you know, 12, 13 months old, wanting to trail too much, yep. not yep. bad dogs, stuff like that. Good houndman, good houndsman can see past that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? I It just seems like we, I'm going to bring this up now, but we hunted last night. Uh, we've got a little female that is a good bred dog. Actually, she goes back to rat and goes back to Sackett Jr., uh, she's six years old and she's a dog that, that she's looking to get treed, but she's pretty accurate. You know, she's not a trailing type dog, but last night she stayed on the ground for an hour and 50 minutes and I finally caught her crossing the road. But you can see, you know, flashes and things and stuff that she does and it goes back to this or it goes back to that. And so the dumb, the dumb stuff they do kind of gets, you know, you understand it, you know, just like, yeah. just like that female, I assume. Yeah. Coming, uh, 
the cord and tail cross back and forth was all standing crosses. Really? Yeah. And uh, that worked out extremely well. Yeah. And really, tell only, I don't think tell through uh, maybe 360 some pups. Yeah, I knew, really yeah I knew tell didn't have a bunch of pups. And it really, it wouldn't have been that many, but I sent him down to Glenn Young's down there in Arkansas for a yeah. winter, and he bred several females there. I believe that's now, probably where Shannon, you know, got his yep. stuff from, yep. Yep, uh, that was Sandy. Yep. yep. I've, had, I've heard a lot of guys tell me that was the best dog in Arkansas, that Sandy bitch. Well, when you hear Shannon talk about her, you'd think she was the best dog that ever breathed air. <laughs> <laughs> he was proud of her. He wasn't? was. He, uh, Shannon's, go Shannon's goofy, but he loves dogs and he loves coot hunting, and that's usually enough yeah. for me. I, that don't one, bother me too bad. One thing about Shannon, if he had a Pepsi in the hand, it was the best Pepsi they ever made. <laughs> <laughs> and but now, he was a great guy, yeah. you know, and he was a hunter. Yeah, now, by all about. accounts, they said he was great with pups. They said yeah. Shannon, Shannon was great with young dogs, and there's not very many of those. No, no, he was amazingly patient with a young dog. All uh, right. You know, where you or I may want to, I don't know, take the wife out to get a pizza, Shannon, and just, well, I got this nine-week-old pup. I think I'm going to walk it back through the woods. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and he he'd, uh, he's... Must be kinned up here a little bit because he didn't turn them dogs in no picnic. <laughs> no, no, it's rough down there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. I, You know, if there's anything else you guys want to mention, I would love to hear it. Uh, we've hit, you know, about the hour mark, but I, I can go for four hours with you. I love hearing about this stuff. I love hearing about the old dogs. Uh, we love hearing about all this stuff, but if there's anything else you guys want to add, you know, feel free to add it. it. It's been great. You guys are legends of the sport and we really appreciate you being on here. So if there's anything else you guys want to put in here, I'd appreciate hearing it. Well, I'd like to mention a couple of names. Ben Crocker over each of us. Uh, yes, sir. Ben's a good guy. He's, he's started off pretty well cord and tell. And yep. As flash female, I had a lot of respect for, and they put her and her Zario court went into the Hall of Fame at Walker Days the same day. Yeah. And I don't think that ever been done in history. No, that but, quick flash well, was a special dog. Yeah. The Keeper brothers, Ron and Larry, down south of us, they've always worked around. And, and like I say, Doug, Doug McCombs has uh, helped a lot out here. And, and uh, uh, but, and oh, Alan Snedeker down there too. He helped promote. He was kind of Junior's PR man back in those days. Yep. Yeah, people want to get you get up there and all that. I just tell Alan, you take care of it. Yep. You like to get up there and get on that thing. And, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but there's been a lot of people through. We met a lot of great people through it. And had a lot of great people here. And like I say, I'm blessed with. The wife I got, she sat there and gave me a little smirk. Maybe I'll even get supper tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as me personally goes, I enjoy talking with you. And, and uh, uh, Thank you. i tell you what, fellas. Uh, I've always had a lot of respect for you. You know, we've always hunted nailer dogs, and and I'm one thing. Let's touch on that right before we quit. Uh, nailer dogs, Sackett Junior dogs, they come around right at the same time. You know, it's, oh, I it's, loved it, man. Oh, it was just kind of like the friendliest rivalry in the world, but it was still a rivalry. Yes, you know? I've told it, people that a hundred times. Yes. That's the biggest difference between now and back then. There's no rivalries anymore. No, I mean there is. There's. There's nothing like that. I mean, it's it, it was the Michigan Ohio State of coon hunting. Yeah, and you everybody was cordial, everybody was nice, but in the background, yeah. everyone like us and me, me included, that had nailer dogs. You know, we wanted to beat the guys with Sackett Junior dogs, and here we are. We've got both now. You know, and and we're kind of over it. But it was it was kind of a rivalry back in the day. Well, I had a lot of respect for Justin. Mm -hmm. And Russ, I mean, they, 
they uh, they always jump them around any time and any time you see them. Uh, if I see them, you walk across the fairground, shake hands with each other, whatever. Yep. I mean, they I had a lot of respect for them that way, and there was no no belligerency about them at all. It was just uh, we've got what you got. We like what we got. Right. I know you like what you got. And uh, between the two of us, I got no problem whatsoever with having Naylor in a pedigree. Right. And obviously, <laughs> Jess that feels the same way. He's got Sackett Jr. in his pedigrees as well with yeah. dogs he's had in the past and stuff. Yeah. But it was it, uh, they, it was yeah. just it was awesome because and it wasn't so much Frank versus Jess as it was the guys that were handling Naylor dogs and the guys that were handling Sackett Jr. dogs. Yeah. I don't yeah. think, you know, it wasn't, it was and like I said, it wasn't personal. It was, it was the friendliest rivalry on the planet, but it was still there. And I thought it was just fantastic, you know, for everybody involved. Well, that, that type of stuff is what makes anything work out good. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if people call me and, and they say, this is the type of female I got and this is what she's off of. What do you think about crossing in a nailer stock? If I thought it worked for them, I'd absolutely tell them, hey, I think it'll work great. Yeah. If I thought they had too much free dog wrapping up in there, uh, I'd also tell them that. But, yeah. but, uh, uh, but I remember uh, back at Walker days, uh, Jess's brother Charlie was on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I had a female. Uh, Listen, to called, good one. We All called right, Dave. I want to hear it. And uh, man, it was uh, it was like the peak of the rivalry to me. You know, I've yeah. I'm dad's son, Charlie's Jess's brother. He's got a ex's sister. I got a damn good female off from Old Talk. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean. Those two just put it on each other all night long, and it was it was a riot, yeah. you know. Like you said, it was. I, I love coon hunting, and I still like the competition hunt some, but it, it's not like it was back then. No, no, it's not. And you could you could beat Justin Brother Charlie either. He was the case. <laughs> I need to get with Charlie now. Me and Jess are good friends. I was actually supposed to record a podcast for Houndsman XP uh, with Jess yesterday. But like Jess does, he waited <laughs> He waited until about an hour and 10 minutes before I was supposed to get down to his house. And he called me and wanted to do it at a truck stop in the parking lot. And I said, Jess, that's not how this works. <laughs> and I love Jess like a brother, but you know how Jess is just as well as I do. And so mm-hmm. I really, I thought I was going to get Jess Dickerson and Frank and Rob Giddings back to back, but it didn't work out that way. But I'm going to get with Jess next weekend, so it's going to be good. But yeah, it was, it was great. I I think it was great for the sport. And if social media would have been as big as it is now, I think it would. Oh, I think it would have just been huge. It had just exploded because yeah. there's not two dominant stud dogs now. The the stud dog world has changed. Uh, it's not the same as it used to be, you know, it's just, it's just a little different, I think. Yeah. I think that's because dogs like Naylor and Junior did their job, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. They, uh, old, uh, Mabel and, well, uh, Daisy there that Rob was on, you could train pups with her, but they better not put no teeth in her. That's right. Mabel... And I like Mabel. Yeah, but, X, uh, X, I like I, mean, uh, I liked X better than Mabel, but Mabel was a little rough at times. Time that cast and over and Rod come in, I told him I'll go. He said, Charlie won the cast on the last goal, but we had a great hunt. He got yeah. her out of the box, and I thought he had a Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what the hell happened to her? Uh, he says, we had a little bit of a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah Cass Mabel. was there, and Charlie was there and walked by him. And uh, Jess said, I would call, and he said, you need to buy that female right there. And he said, why? And her and old Mabel made five trees or whatever it was, said, Mabel couldn't put her off. (laughs) 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 You know know how Charlie talks there. We made that first tree, and they made it together. Right. And we 
we walked in there and it, it was pretty obvious some stuff was going down when yeah. we were on the way in there you know and we get there mabel's got her ear cut and i'm going oh man you know how it is yep oh I do. man charlie looks down at her and goes it's a long way from her heart and i was like oh this is yeah <laughs> i like this dude <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story about Jess before I get Jess on the podcast. Um, and this I, this is all hearsay, but it's been hearsay from people that I rely on and, and count on to be the truth. But Jace, Jess was hunting Tall Timber Little X, and, and my brother was hunting Fistful of Dollars, which is a really good was a really good dog, too. That's a dog I finished a gold champion and, and was a nice dog, too, but he was a little rough. And uh, they drew a dog over at the Bear Creek Classic called Night Train, and uh, first tree, little X, dollar, train, all in the same tree. And I mean, it comes into a war. I mean, an absolute bloodbath dogfight. And uh, X is treeing, dollar's treeing, and this train dog's treeing. And pretty soon X shuts up after a dogfight, and it's just dollar. And then pretty soon nothing's barking but you can hear the dog fight and my brother was hunting in this cast and he says jess what do you think's going on and he said well jeremy he goes i think uh he's done killed mine and he's working on yours <laughs> <laughs> and and no lie they get to this tree uh x is he's hiding in the weeds he's cut up uh dollar has got his uh nameplate pinch shut where the dog had bit him on the collar and he can't breathe. And so he's laying in the weeds and they get him kind of resuscitated and trained. He's still treeing. And Jess looks over at the handler of training and says, how much you want for that one? <laughs> <laughs> and Jess, Jess buys that dog and that, that was that. <laughs> so, yeah, there's been, there's been some crazy times in this sport. We've had, we've had met great people. And I know you guys are just like me, and we appreciate what we've got and, and the people that we've met through this. And uh, Frank and Rob, I really appreciate you guys sitting down with me. I really want to do it again, but next time, let's do it in person. I'll drive up to Michigan. You talked about these uh, northern Michigan hunters. My family's from Pelston, right there south of the bridge. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. 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 You so know I, what I'm talking about. Yep, that. I know exactly what you're talking about. We were a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll get up there i'll be able to visit some of my aunts uncles cousins etc and maybe i can swing over with you guys and go hunting one night and we can do this again in person well, you're, you're welcome anytime i sure appreciate it fellas and I, I like i said i appreciate you joining us uh both of you are a wealth of knowledge and the background and and some of the stuff that you guys do have done with these dogs is very impressive and i just want to thank you again uh, for being giving me this opportunity to talk to you really enjoyed it man i did too frank rob uh i'm gonna go ahead and push this stop button and we will get this wrapped up and like i said let's do it again uh this is josh michaelis with the fuel by joy podcast and thank you ladies and gentlemen very much for listening Wow, what uh, what an amazing time. Uh, what a joy it was and a privilege it was to sit down with Frank and Rob. And uh, I, I hope you guys liked it because I had a fantastic time bringing it to you. Uh, like I said, that is kind of uh, my area of interest, you know, with the hounds. And, of course, with a name like, like Frank. And, you know, it was it was just a joy. It was a real pleasure and a real honor. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for listening. Uh, we've got a lot of things in store uh, coming up for the Fuel by Joy podcast. And so uh, we're really excited about it. We're really excited to bring it to you. And like I said, uh, just stay tuned every week. We're hoping to bring you this, you know, things like this consistently. And, and we hope it's something that, you know, is going to help bring light to these working dogs and to these amazing handlers and owners and trainers and things like that. So, like I said... Really, really, really uh, appreciate all our customers, all our fans, all our listeners, and all the messages that we've been getting uh, over the podcast. So uh, stay tuned next week and enjoy. Maggie, the
birds are showing her howl as long But she refuses to die Maggie will live 100 years longer than I Maggie, the mud's always down in a rut Looking for some bone that she buried 